Our Father in heaven, we call upon you to uh, be with us today by sending your spirit to open our minds, illumine us, so we would understand what it is that you have for us in our lives, our Lord, to be missionaries for Jesus Christ. We know that the Lord himself gave the Great Commission, and we want to fulfill that. So bless us in this time that we might get a passion for missions, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 All right, just to uh, do a little overview here, uh, the strategy that we're using here at church is called the Jesus Built Church Model. It's built on the great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, and the great commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We started off with doing a survey of the life of Christ. Remember what? Remember when we did that? Anybody here remember all that? Anybody remember the regions? We had the Mediterranean Sea, right? Sea of Galilee up here. I moved to different country. Jordan River, Dead Sea. Over here was Judea, Samaria, Galilee. Over here was the Capolis, right? Is that where I am now? And then Perea. All right. Then we went through all the cities, and we did that for a specific reason, so we would know how we could harmonize the gospels through the movements of the life of Christ. All right. We did that the first week, and we. Started the second missionary, or the first missionary journey, uh, where the headquarters of the church at then was Antioch, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the, they went out to Cyprus, crossed back up into Turkey. Uh, there was two Antiochs, Antioch here and Antioch Pisidian, uh, uh, Antioch uh, Iconium Lister Derby, and then. Uh, but when they got this far, John Mark left them, and so it's just Paul and Barnabas on the first uh, missionary journey uh, after. After they'd made it all the way to Derby, they went back to Lystra, Iconium, and then back to Antioch, uh, Mysia, then they came back to uh, Antioch, and the first missionary journey was over. Boy, I summarized that one real fast. Cool. Second missionary journey, we learned last time that there was a, it started with a big disagreement. Anybody remember what it was about? John Mark. Yeah. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark. Paul said, no way. He deserted. So the two split. And now we got two missionaries. You know, there were more, more missionaries. Most of the disciples went somewhere. Thomas went somewhere, you know, Andrew. They all they all scattered. So that the gospel is going in all, all kinds of directions. But the, the, the biblical record only records for us in an inspired record of the history that Barnabas went to Cyprus. We don't know where he went after that. In an inspired record. The inspired record focuses on Paul, because Paul goes up through Syria, Cilicia, and then he backtracks, just as he went through Galatia and Phrygia. I'm assuming, because it said that he was ministering to the churches, or he was you know, working with the, the saints there, strengthening them in their faith and encouraging them, that he went back through the churches. Uh, then he says also he went through part of Phrygia and Galatia, and then he wanted to, he was forbidden to go into Bithynia, and so he winds up over just a, a, an area of Troas. I get my, my dots off the map. I'm sorry about that. Okay, I don't know what happened. My computer, I had it this morning trying to get everything back in the right place, and I, I missed some. But uh, from Troas, uh, they go up, and the, the first stop that they're making actually in Europe for a convert. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I picked the wrong way. Uh, the first one, they have their first con convert at a place called. Philippi, the first European convert. And I was mentioning last time, well, he wanted to go to Bithynia, which would have probably led him in a different direction, but we get a convert in Europe, and Christianity goes to Europe. From Europe, you get the great missionary movement in Great Britain that brings the gospel to good old USA. The USA becomes a great citadel of missions in the 19th century. We'll talk about that a little later on. But anyway, they're up in a gal by the name of uh, Lydia, uh, but she's from Thyatira, which is right probably where her cheek is uh, on the, the map. And but she's living in Philippi, and Philippi is a <laughs> Roman settlement town. And uh, oh, I'm going the wrong way again. Sorry about that. I do that every now and then. Uh, remember, there was the girl that was uh, possessed with a demon, and she was shouting that there's a there's a way of salvation. Paul said, "Get come out of her." 
and then because she was great financial gain, caused all kinds of problem, uh, and then that Paul gets thrown into jail. Paul and Silas are in jail. They're singing Midnight Hour. Remember that? And uh, the doors are open. He's going to kill himself. But uh, the, the call goes out, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. All right? So <clears throat> it's to this Philippi, these people, when you read, when you get the book of Philippians, when you're reading that, from the book of Acts, we can find who the people are that he's writing to. Isn't that pretty cool? And so you got to just kind of coordinate the scriptures and all of that. All right. We're going to pick up the new uh, the gospel always gets a reaction. That's where I want to show from the, the next section of the book of Acts. It always gets a reaction. So there will be four reactions we'll look at. You can probably find more, but these are the four I'm going to focus on. First of all, there's resistance. When they had passed through uh, Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. So I got the two, uh, Amphipolis and Ap Apollonia. They come to a place called Thessalon Thessalonica. Anybody ever heard that name before? No. Yeah, there is a book of the Bible, or letters, two, two, two epistles called the Thessalonians. Thessalonians. And so whatever what we're going to be seeing here is he's writing to the people that experience this history. That's why the book of Acts, you have to coordinate it with the epistles. All right? So they come to Thessalonians where there was a Jewish synagogue, which means there was at least ten family of Jews, because if there are ten families to incorporate a synagogue. So they had ten families of Jews at least in that area. And as it was Paul's custom, he went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Holy Scriptures. Three Sabbath days. So, that could have been from two, two weeks in one day. All right. So, you know, uh, here's a week and here's a week, because it, it was three Sabbath days. Sabbath day, a week, Sabbath day, a week, and a Sabbath day. He could have been there as short as two weeks in one day. Or, he could have been there, you know, three weeks and six days. So that he arrived just after the Sabbath, for a whole week, Sabbath, whole week, Sabbath, whole week, just short of a Sabbath. So he could have been there, okay, uh, basically less than two weeks, or could have been there a month. We're not sure the way, way, way that is. But in any case, it is a very short time. Because when you read in the book of First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, every major doctrine is talked about. So in that short of time, he had taught them enough that they had questions about different issues of theology, which tells me that the early church was a teaching church. It was, it was a lot of teaching was going on. People were being taught in the Christian faith, and that's why Christian education is so important even in our church. All right. He was explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. Now, since there's no New Testament written at this point, how is he doing that? Old Testament. Old Testament. He's, ex you know, he's, he's explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. <clears throat> so I think he's going to places like Isaiah 53, all right, where it talks about the suffering servant, and, and people are coming to know the Lord because he's reasoning and explaining that. And this is this Jesus that I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. He said, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of the God-fearing Greeks, and not, not, not a few prominent women. Sometime we'll do a study on the prominent women of the Bible, because the women played a very, very, very important role in the Bible, especially in the ministry of Jesus. They basically funded his ministry. You can find that in the Gospels, okay? But anyway, there's a prominent women here, and... <clears throat> But the Jews were jealous. Paul's having success. People are coming <coughs> over and accepting Christ and getting saved. And so, <clears throat> welcome back. How was it? All right, I got a lesson going on. So keep the noise. Oh, you're sleeping already. <laughs> All right, that'll help keep the noise up. <clears throat> so he's having great success, but the Jews were jealous. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. <clears throat> they formed a mob and started a riot in the city, and they rushed on Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas <clears throat> in order to bring them out to the crowd. This is bad news going on. You know, you got a good thing going, and there's always some bad apple messes the whole thing up. <clears throat> these men who have, this is what they're saying, the crowd is saying, these men have caused trouble all over the world, and now have come here. 
uh, all over the world. Would we exaggerate things? With, with, yeah. <laughs> all over the world. And Jason has welcomed them into his house, and they are defying Caesar's decree, saying that some other, there's another king, one called Jesus. Whoa, now, you know, this is... <clears throat> Caesar was king, and you're saying there's another king? Oh, my goodness. And we do believe Jesus is king, isn't he? King, Jesus, king, Jesus. And so we got this conflict going on very early on. It's, it's, it's of political nature. Has politics ever been contentious before? <laughs> is it still? <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Uh, when they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into a turmoil, and they made a, uh, <clears throat> they made Jason, <coughs> then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Three weeks at Thessalonica, or at least three Sabbaths, okay, maybe a month, maybe a little less. And uh, so they already got to go on, on the move. It is not uncommon for us to get information back from missionaries where there is problems. That should be normal. It was back then. It's going to be normal now. I don't know what problem our missionary, the goods, are going to have. They're going to encounter, but they will encounter problems. Because when you're doing a good work, our adversary, the devil, doesn't just sit on his hands. He opposes that, and that's, that's what's been going on. So they flee to Berea. I love Berea. You know why I love Berea? Because I grew up in the Berean Baptist Church. <laughs> My Sunday school teacher, when I was in the third grade, uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Robinson, worked for the Detroit Free Press. And one of his jobs was proofreading the newspaper before it was actually went through all the press. And so he was a speed reader. And I can remember in class, he would say, I know it's an act somewhere, and he would just take his finger and run down the page and flip the page. And, there it is, and he'd read the verse. He could read with comprehension faster than I could stroke my hand down the pages. Jeez. I was so impressed by him. But he's the one that explained to me what it meant to be a Berean. And here's what it means to be a Berean, okay? On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. First stop, always to check, check in with the Jews. And it says, now the Bereans were more noble. It says more noble character. The word character is added into the translation. It's just simply they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. So they were more noble. We assume that it was character. Some think it, there was a nobility of character. Some, some think it was actually they were noble or royalty. I don't think so. I think this translation has it right. They were more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for this is what they did. Number one, they received the message with great eagerness. They were hungry for the Word of God. And that's what Mr. Robinson used to tell us, that we, we that's why the Bible is so important. And it says, with great, they, they received the message with great eagerness, and then secondly, they examined the Scriptures every day. This is daily Bible study. They're no, they are more noble in character because they receive the Word of God and they examine it every day. The word for examine is a, a legal term. It would be to do a legal scrutinizing of something to see what exactly technically it says. So they were being very technical about the scriptures every day this day to see if what Paul said was true. And so we were taught in the third grade you had the right to question what the preacher was preaching by looking it up in the Bible for yourself. And so it was very important at Berean Baptist Church that everybody carried their Bibles to church because you were to examine and see, is that really what the Bible says? You're not taking it from the man, you want to take it from God. And so it was really important to bring your Bible and uh, check to see what, what, what is there. Bible memorization was really big. You probably noticed, I know a few verses, right? It started as a child where Bible memorization was really an important part, being able to cross-reference what was being said. goes on and said, many of the Jews believed uh, because of this. They believed not on an emotional impulse, but they believed rationally, intellectually, as well as from their heart, as did a number of prominent Greek women and many of the Greek men. When the Jews at Thessalonica, back here, heard that they had gone to, to uh, Berea, and they were preaching the word there. They went there too and agitated, agitated, stirred up the crowd so that the brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. Apparently Paul was the agitator because Paul was the main preacher. 
And uh, so he leaves two behind, and then he makes his trek down. The men who escorted him brought him down to Athens. And so we got uh, the Apostle Paul going down to Athens, and he left instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Man, he is at the heart of idolatry. Anybody uh, ever read any Greek mythology? Yeah. Could you name some of the Greek gods? Zeus, Apollo. Go on. There's a whole bunch of them. I mean, there's a whole pantheon. Yeah. Okay. Unknown god. He's finding. He's finding idols everywhere. And, and so he so he went to the synagogue. There's a synagogue there. There's more than 10, 10 Jewish families there. He reasoned in, in the synagogue as well as in the marketplace. Paul is vocal everywhere he goes. A group of Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, secular philosophers of the of the we would they would call those ancient philosophers, they began to dispute with him. Some of them asked him, "What is this bla bla babbler trying to say?" <laughs> All right, <clears throat> others. He seems to be advocating a foreign gods. Okay, so they're not sure what Paul's talking about here. <clears throat> so as a result, they said <clears throat> said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection, <clears throat> about Jesus that, that he rose from the dead. <clears throat> then they took him and brought him to a, the meeting of the Areopagus. Are I can't say it now. Areopagus. That's not right. I'm not saying it right. Areopagus. Uh, they take him to the Areopagus. <clears throat> where this is the mountain. This right. This mountain is the Areopagus. It's still there today. All right. And <clears throat> where they said to him, now this at the mountain. I'm not sure if it was on top of it or at the base of it. <clears throat> but they held like the the civil courts there, <clears throat> and all the philosophers, the wise people, uh, the legal people, they would meet at, at the base of it. <clears throat> so they took him there. And they said, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. So he's there with the philosophers, and they're wanting to know what he's teaching. <clears throat> you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to hear what they mean. Then Paul, <clears throat> and Paul said to them, now, this is a sermon of Paul. So maybe I should do this again. <laughs> All right, a sermon of Paul. <clears throat> Men of Athens, I see in every way you are very religious. For as I was walking around and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. It was like, in case we missed... <laughs> Got a little insurance plan here. In case we missed the right God, the unknown one out there. <clears throat> okay, now, what you worship as something unknown, I am going to proclaim to you. He leverages that. Okay. Every day there are opportunities for us in people's lives, something happens that if we were like Paul, we would leverage that to talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll bet we miss dozens of them every day. We're not as finely tuned in. <clears throat> so one day I'm at work. Ladies work I was working in for a company called Sencom. <clears throat> Ladies at the photocopy machine. And all of a sudden I heard her say, Oh Jesus. And I looked at her and said, oh, I know him. <laughs> she looked at me. <laughs> she said, well, a little embarrassed. I do too. <laughs> and so then I, said, I started talking to her about, yeah, you know, I'm a Christian. I know Jesus. She said, well, yeah. She said, maybe I should have said that as a prayer. Dear Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, every day opportunities, doors of opportunity open themselves to us. <clears throat> He leverages the fact, going to, oh, the unknown God. I know the God you don't know. All right? So one day when I was doing door-to-door -door visitation in Philadelphia for the church, I come to a house, and the guy says to me, I'm an agnostic. I said, oh, great, I'd love to talk to you. He says, what do you mean? I'm an agnostic. I said, yeah, agnostic. Ah means no. Gnostic means knowledge. You don't know, I do know. Let me tell you what I know so you can know too. <laughs> of course, he didn't let me tell him anyway. Close the door. Because I mean, he didn't want to know. Okay, He didn't want to know. And so these people, obviously, they, they want to know. Come on in. Come on in. Anybody else on And obviously, they want to know because they got a, an altar to the unknown God. So... And so he, Paul is leveraging that. Say, okay, I, I got what you, you need to know. 
the God who made the world and everything in it. He starts with creation. That's where uh, Paul started earlier. We went through the one sermon. He starts with, with going back to creation. Uh, God is a creator. I want to tell you who God is. God is the creator. Uh, and let me go back up. I just kind of read his sermon. It, it is the Lord of heaven and earth that does not live in a temple built with hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. He's a self-sufficient God. Because he himself gives all men life. He's a life-giving God and breath and everything else. He's, he's responsible for everything, this God. Oh, there comes our verse. The second thing he talks about, here's our verse. Everybody help me with it. Okay, we can read it together. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. It's right out of his sermon. He's speaking to those who don't know God. And he's telling them, I know God. He's the God who is the creator. He made everybody. But he's also a God of providence. He's determined. There's no accident, Paul's saying, that I'm here right now preaching to you. It was a sign by God. He said, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him. I think I got that. Seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him. He's the creator God. He's in control of everything. And he wants you to reach out to him because he's reachable. You can have a relationship with the true and living God, though he is not far from each one of us. Oh, he's omnipresent. So I think... I think he's going to go on and say, in, for in him, this, I was going to quote this verse, it's next. For in him, we live and move and have our being. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And so I am, I'm, right now, I'm in God. I'm walking in God. This is mind-boggling. I, I, I could get sidetracked on this theology. Because God is not composed of parts. He's an invisible spirit. So the totality of all of God is on the very tip of my finger. And at the same time, He is everywhere and supersedes all space. God exists so different than I do. I take up a little piece of, piece of space, you know, God supersedes everything. And so I, I sometimes, I think so small of God that He is like confined to a body like me and a little brain like mine. He is not. He's omniscient. He's great. He's huge. I, I, he's just so wholly different from us. God is just incredibly awesome. He says, all right, for in him we live, move, and have our being. Did I ever tell you my story about the kid that went to church? Before he went to church, he stopped at the hot dog stand outside, bought a hot dog. Did I tell you that? Mm -hmm. And so he ate half the hot dog, and then church was starting, so he put the other hot dog in his pocket and went into church. And the preacher was preaching of all things on that. In him we live, move, and have our being. He's in front of us. He's behind us. He's next to us. He's on the right of us. He, you know, he's, he's even in your pockets. And the kid jumped up and said, Oh, Lord, please don't eat my hot dog. <laughs> I thought that was the funniest joke. That was a kid. It's still funny. All right. <laughs> Therefore, since we are God's offspring, as some of your own poets have said, now, I don't know if Paul was versed in the poets of the Greeks or if he saw this along the way in his readings. Because, you know, they got inscriptions on, on buildings just like we have today. If you were like in, ever in Rome, we've seen the old Roman in, inscriptions when we were in Italy, and they're on, on the buildings. As some of, the, of some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. So he knows that's a quote from one of their poets. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, he's using their language to teach that we are made in the image of God. Isn't that way first chapter of Genesis says? Okay, God made man and, of the, and he made him in his own image. He, he's capitalizing that. He said, therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stones. No, he's, he's really hit to the heart of what's going on. I saw all your statues. You can't make God, okay? You can't make God because you're the offspring. He's not your offspring. See what he's saying? He's flipping this on them. And he's saying, he's not an image made by the hands of man's designer skills. And so he goes, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a date by which he will judge. Oh, I got your word to... Now he commands all men everywhere to repent. For now he set a date that he will judge 
the world with justice. He's the creator, God of providence, he's reachable, but he's also your judge. One day we are all going to stand before God. All of us. He's your judge. He will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. He touches on raising Jesus from the dead. So he brings us all to Jesus. See what he's doing? From creation, providence, he's reachable. You're going to be judged by God for your sins. You need Jesus the Savior. That's basically the flow. Okay? And, and that's what he's doing. You're raising him from the dead. As soon as he talks about resurrection, when they heard about this, the resurrection from the dead, the reaction is they ridiculed Paul by sneering. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Not everyone is going to respond positively to my gospel message. You know, the Apostle Paul later writes in Timothy letter, he's trying to encourage a young preacher, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may obtain the same salvation with eternal glory. All right? I think that's 2 Timothy 2.10. I endure all things for the elect's sake. This is what Paul's saying. I know God has chosen people out there. I don't know who they are. So I preach to everybody. So that when it's going to land on one that God has chosen, he's going to respond. And when that person responds, that takes it off. I, I, can't, I can't get anybody else saved. God does the saving. So I speak to everybody, and I have this assurance that there will be some who will respond. Here we have some who will want to hear him again. Others won't, won't want to hear, hear you again. At that, Paul left the council. And a few of them became followers of Paul and believed. Isn't that great? God has, right even today, He's got people in Hungary that we've sent our missionaries to who are going to respond to the good news message from the goods. Right? But He also has them right here in Waterford to respond to the good news message from us. From us. We all have to share that message. Okay, above them was Dionysius. Oh, I love that guy. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, that translates in English as Dennis. Oh, I'm in the Bible. It's the only place I am. Anybody know? Remember what I said I, my, my name meant? No, it comes from the Greek god, goddess, actually. Uh, uh, a god called Dionysius. Okay, somebody was named by, after this Greek god. God of wine or something? God of wine and debauchery and drunkenness. <laughs> That's my name. And I said, Mom, what are you thinking? What are you thinking of? I'm the preacher? Uh, anyway, he was a member of the Areopagus, which I can't say it, and uh, also a woman uh, by the name of uh, Demarius and a number of others. But these are the people who believed. I'm so, so thankful I'm in the Bible as a believer. <laughs> All right. Anyway, the next section we come here is uh, the fourth reaction is a reviled. Paul, uh, after his experience at Corinth, I mean at Athens, he moves on. After this, Paul left Athens and he went to Corinth. Now, <clears throat> at Corinth, there he met a Jew by the name of Aquila. And here I, I got a, a friend from a previous church dressed up for a Christmas play. That, you know, <laughs> Aquila, all right? And uh, he was a native of Pontus. Look where Pontus is. Are you getting the picture here? A lady from Thyatira is in Philippi. A person from Pontus is over in Corinth. Are you seeing what's going on here? The world, because they're in the Pax Romana. Anybody remember that? Pax Romana, the Roman Empire, thousand years of peace. And they had these great road system. People traveled all over the world then. That made the flow of the gospel rapid because people were constantly traveling and winding up, we're going to find more travelers. You're going to see this as we go on. It's like our world today, just not as fast. No airplanes and no, no, they had sailboats, and, and, but they didn't have, you know, ocean liners taking across. But it was very, the, the, the world was a mixed bag. People were everywhere. And, and uh, you would find African people in Italy, and you would find Italians in Egypt. You, I mean, it was all commingled. And I don't think there was quite the racism that there is today, which amazes me. I mean, there was some, but not to the degree that we have even today. We have digressed rather than progressed, in my opinion. Okay, so he meets this Jew named Aquila. He's from Pont Pontus, 
but it was recently came from Italy. Now I don't have Italy on the map. It's way over here. He came, so he lived there. He's been in Italy. Now he's in Corinth. He must have been a businessman with his wife Priscilla. All right. Oh no, he's not a businessman. I remember what he is now. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker. Now, I got a pretty extravagant tent here, don't I? <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I thought it was like a little pub tent. <laughs> but I got a feeling that it was a little bit better tent than that. He was a tent maker, and, 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 as, and Paul was too. It says, and because he was a tent maker, as they, he stayed and worked with them. Paul was bivocational. When the funds weren't coming in from the churches, because I do know they do, Philippi uh, had sent him a gift. The book of Philippians is a thank you note to the people at Philippi. Remember we looked at the people from Philippi? He's saying, thank you for the gift of support. Like we're supporting the goods. In any case, <clears throat> when the money wasn't there, he did like everybody else. I got to eat, so I got to work. And he was working. Every Sabbath day, though, he reasoned in the synagogues, <laughs> trying to persuade the Jews and the Greek. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, they finally catch up. Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Our missions is all about a proclamation of a message, who Jesus is, and in the wake of every place he goes, preaching that message, there is a church that is planted. I'm going to suggest that genuine missions is church planting. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, the word abusive is blasphemous. So they were saying some pretty nasty things about him. Does that stuff go on today? Look at the political world. Holy smokes. Name calling, badgering. It's crazy. They were doing the same to Apostle Paul then. He shook, off the, uh, shook out his clothes in protest, and he said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. What was he doing? To the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. He said, Every time I confront you Jews, you give me such a hard time. He shakes off the dust and says, Listen, I'm moving on. I'm going to the Gentiles. There's a huge turn in Paul's ministry. He's been turning all along, because he's always turning to the Gentiles. But now on, he's saying, this is very deliberate for me. Then Paul left the synagogue, and he went next door to the house of uh, Titius, Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire, entire household believed. He's, he's having great success. People are accepting his message. They believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. I think if you read the book of Acts, you'll see that every time there's a baptism, the person either believes, accepts the word, receives the word, uh, that God opens their heart. There's always a spiritual transformation before there is the public pro proclamation by being baptized. But that's why Baptists have historically called this believer's baptism. And we have historically not baptized until a person has made a profession, a credible profession of faith about Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then we baptize in any case, <clears throat> one night the Lord spoke, spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. And you might have thought, after all, every place I go, I wind up in trouble because I'm preaching. <laughs> and God said, keep it up. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack or harm you because I have many people in this city. Remember what I was quoting earlier? You know? Uh, that the Lord has His chosen? He said, no, I've already got them. you just got to get the message out to them. They're going to respond positively to you. As a result of that, so Paul stayed there for a year and a half. For 18 months, Paul stays teaching them the Word of God. So he's trying to ground a really good, strong church. Has anybody ever read 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians, what are the people like? <laughs> Oh my goodness, this is like the worst, worst carnal. They're like the worst church you could possibly. He's there for 18 months trying to straighten out this mess. I mean, they're everything. Every you name the you name the sin, they're involved in it. Even incest. I mean, they're in homosexuality. They're in embezzlement. They're in drunkenness. I mean, it's just crazy. And and, and so Paul is here. Did you hear my message this morning? It wasn't the elite. He was working with the people who had great sins in their lives that they would repent and turn from those ways 
And there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 10. And after listing a catalog of sins, uh, then he says, that's what you were, past tense. But you are sanctified and you are justified in the name of Jesus. Jesus turned those people's lives around. Did some of them slip back into it? Yeah. Have any of you ever, uh, since you've been a Christian, told a lie? <coughs> Anybody here not told a lie since I've been a Christian? Oh, no hands went up. You're all guilty. <laughs> Do you, you, you think that uh, the embezzler didn't have the temptation to embezzle again and maybe slip? Yeah, of course. We're in a process of sanctification. But we are justified. Justified means we're declared righteous. And I'm going to have a sanctified means I'm living like it. I'm living like it. And that's what he's there. He's there working with them, the Word of God teaching at Corinth. All right? Well, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Galileo was a proconsul of Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into, into his court. All right, and, but, but he says, it involves questions about words and names of your own law. Uh, settle that matter yourself. I will not be a judge of such thing. So he had them ejected from his court. So they go to the political process of trying to do, get Paul ejected for what he's preaching. And this guy's saying, well, that's your own stuff. I'm not getting in the middle of your, your religious stuff. And then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. They take him out they're beating the guy because he didn't win the case. All right? But, but the, the judge shows no concern whatsoever. And Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. So Paul was in Corinth for a while, trying to straighten out that church. Then he left the brothers and he sailed to Syria. Uh, to, actually, and sailed for Syria. He doesn't get there yet. And they arrived at Ephesus. Syria, remembers over here. So he sails, he arrives at Ephesus, where Paul left Priscilla and Aquila. All right? And so, then he set sail from Ephesus when he landed uh, at Caesarea. Okay, so it goes down to Caesarea. And from Caesarea, he greets the church at Caesarea. And then he went down to Syria. And that is the strangest thing. I said down to, and I go up on the map. That's because Jerusalem is the high point. Anytime you're going away from Jerusalem, you go down. Okay, you always go down. So directions are always given in proximity from Jerusalem. So to go down to Syria, even though we're going north. When I was a kid down in, <coughs> down, uh, and we go down vacation down in Missouri, they didn't call it downtown, they called it uptown. And I thought that was the strangest thing, because here we go downtown. Down there they talk about going uptown. And, and, and it's just confusing to me as a kid. How do you know the difference between uptown and downtown? Because they're always the same thing, the center of town. <laughs> and so, but then just, just a different way that the terminology here. In any case, all right, here's the whole picture. Take off, go through Galatia, Phrygia, want to go into Bithynia, says no, go over here. Macedonian man's calling him. He winds up in Philippi, have the early first converts, go to Thessalonica, Berea, from there down to Athens, Corinth, Ephesus, and the Caesarea and back. Man, they are really traveling. The missionary on the move. Starting churches. Starting churches. So what are we to think or make of all of this? And I got a few things. Everywhere we go, we are to witness. Everywhere. Everywhere. You know, we're always on the job as Christians. Always. Peter says we're to be ready to give every man a reason of hope that lies within us. I'm to be ready for somebody to ask about my faith. Well, if I don't live it out much, nobody's ever asking. <laughs> so I live it so people are provoked to ask it. And when they are asking me, then I give a response to it. And that's the way it goes. Everywhere we go, we're witnesses. People will react differently to the different ways to you, just like they did to him. Some will resist you, some will receive you, welcome you like the Bereans. Uh, some will ridicule you and despise you, and some will revile you. But don't ever forget, the gospel always gets a reaction. There's always a reaction to your message. Always, always. All right? This would be a break time. How are we doing? Oh, we're doing terrible. <laughs> Third missionary journey. Are we ready? No. Anybody need a break? If you do, just get up and go. We'll keep on going without you. Right. <laughs> this is about the message. And he starts off with uh, the inadequate message. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out from there. Okay, he's been in Antioch. He sets out from there and he traveled to places throughout the region of Galatia. So he's backtracking through the regions of Galatia. 
and uh, Phrygia, and he strengthens all the disciples. So we don't know what churches he went to, but I'm assuming he went to the places, uh, you know, uh, backwards. Or, I, well, it goes Iconium, Lister, and Derby. Okay, uh, Antioch, Iconium, Lister, Derby. Those are what do I can't say them backwards right now. Okay, but he goes through. The, I'm assuming he touched bases with those churches, and, and he goes through Galatia, the churches that he's established. Meanwhile, there is a Jew named Apollos. I got him over here. That is not a friend of mine. I don't know. I've never met this guy. <laughs> I don't know who this guy is. But he's Apollos. And he's a native of Alexandria. He's down here. Native of Alexandria. He came. See, the world, the people are just traveling. They're all over the world, it seems like. He, it says here, he came to Ephesus. So he made his way up to Ephesus. I don't know if he went by land or by sea, but he made it there. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So he, he, he's a, a scholar of some sort. And he's got this really deep knowledge of the scripture, but it goes on. He knows the Bible. He knows the Bible. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He had never experienced baptism after making a credible profession of faith in Jesus as his Savior. He had been baptized by John, so I take it that he'd been under the ministry of John. John never left uh, that region, so it wasn't like he went down to Alexandria to baptize this guy. So he'd been up in the Jerusalem area. John was baptizing in the Jordan River near Enon. And, and so he got baptized there by John, and he knows about Jesus. He's preaching about the way, and he's doing it accurately, but he's never been baptized having become a believer in Jesus. See, Jesus, he's a member of the way. He's accepted Jesus. Jesus is the way. So I made this pathway through palm trees. She said, I have the way. Okay. And so he'd been taught accurately about Jesus, but he only knows the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. He goes to the synagogue. He's speaking up about, about Jesus. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. He just wants to say, hey, you're wrong on anything, but let me, let me share with you uh, something you're missing. And when Apollos wanted to go to Acacia, uh, to Acacia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him on arriving. He was a great help to those uh, by the grace of God. So he takes off and he goes to Achaia, which is where Corinth and Athens are at. Okay. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debates, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He's a powerful preacher. And so, <clears throat> while Apollos was now in Corinth, he introduces him for a reason. Initially, he's going to pick up again with the Apostle Paul. Paul took the road through the interior, and he arrives at Ephesus. So he's been over in Galatia, working with the churches. He makes his way across to Ephesus, and it's at Ephesus there that he found some disciples. And he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Good question. And they answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And so he says, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, well, John's baptism, they replied. See how he set up the story? Apollos is a great preacher, he's preaching, but they've only been baptized by John. And so now Paul arrives, and he finds out, there's people there that uh, have not, the only baptism they know is from John, and they've not received the Holy Spirit. And so Paul says John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. If you begin in any of the Gospels, you find John was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Why were they being baptized? This was a baptism that you were repenting of your sins because the kingdom of heaven, the king, is at hand. And so he told them to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. That's what John's message was. There's one coming after me. He's the Messiah. Believe in him. And so that was the message of John. On hearing this, they were, baptized, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul preaches that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of what John was, was teaching. And so now they're going to be baptized or baptized in the name of Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. And, and then he says, when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they spoke in tongues and prophesied. 
And there are about 12 of them in all. Okay. So we have this phenomena taking place that when they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, not just the Messiah that is to come, even though they've been previously baptized, they are now re-baptized, the hands are laid on them, the Spirit comes, they speak in tongues. Now, tongues is not some kind of gibberish. The word tongues means language. So they began to speak in a foreign language. In Acts chapter 2, when they spoke in the foreign language, every man, and it lists like eight different locations, heard it in their own language. So the language was, God, this was an ability that the Holy Spirit gave for a person to speak in a language they never learned to communicate the message, usually the gospel, to those who did not know the language you were speaking. So there's this phenomenon going on to verify the fact that what they've done is, just, is right. It's, it's followed up with the presence of the Holy Spirit through the message of tongues. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked on the whole issue of tongues. We'll be here for a while. <laughs> but uh, I believe the tongues are, are not... <clears throat> I don't believe that tongues is a, a normal operation of the Holy Spirit in the age in which we live today. And I could take a little while to talk about that. And we could get really deep into this, but I'm not going to do that. We're, there were about 12 of them in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them and he took the disciples with him and they and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And then he went on, this went on for two years. So now he's at Ephesus. Every day he's going down to the, the local college and he's teaching. He's not getting paid for it. He's just going down teaching. I have a nephew who has a ministry that goes on campus and he debates with um, the philosophers about <clears throat> the Christian way. And uh, it's, it's very cool. He'll get on panel discussions and debates with uh, the, the, the philosophy department staff uh, at the, the, the Glendale... Uh, community college, I think, is where the one was, and uh, he argues, but he he is a philosopher himself, and he pens them down and points out that Jesus Christ is the only one who can answer all the philosophical issues. You have no philosophical basis for morality and all, all kinds of things. He pens them down with their own arguments and then exposes to them the way. That's exactly Paul was going into their schools, okay, and he's teaching for two years. Paul did this for two years. The imposter's message is next. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were, were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, uh, uh, and the evil spirits left them. <clears throat> the apostles seemed to have all the gifts. I don't know how else to explain it. They had them all. They, they had the gift of healing. They could speak in tongues. They could, they could do it all. But even Paul says he would rather speak in normal language than a tongue any day of the week. Uh, in any case... He's doing these miracles. And uh, so that people are getting sick, the illness, and they're being cured, evil spirits are leaving them. Some Jews who were around, <clears throat> who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus, over those who were demon possessed. Now these are these are non-believers. They would say in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Alright? They're imposters. The seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priests, were doing this. And one day the evil spirit answered them. An evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? <laughs> that would be a scary moment. Oh, I think yeah. <laughs> that an evil spirit is saying, who in the world are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Man, this is, this is like wild stuff, don't you think? <laughs> but who said the Bible's boring? This is pretty cool stuff. When this became known that the Jews and the, uh, among the Jews and the Greek, living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. When Paul's ministry was really clicking, people really believing, and uh, the name of Jesus is just being exalted, it's just cool stuff going on here. Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. 
There, there's a revival going on. There's repentance taking place. A number who had practiced sorcery, all right, uh, brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. I'm taking the old life and I'm burning it. Years ago, we did this at camp. The kids made a commitment to re recommit their lives to, to Jesus. We built a bridge out of wood. We had a big bonfire. And we had all the kids walk across the bridge. I'm leaving the old behind. Then we took the bridge and we put it on the bonfire and burned it up. You can't go back. You can't go back. There's a revival breaking out here, okay? They're burning their past. And in this way, the world, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I like that. It's not just a, the church is not just growing in number of people, but the word is growing in their lives, and their lives are becoming powerful. Powerful. They're powerful Christians. Next is the inoffensive message, also called being politically correct. Okay. <clears throat> After that, all this had happened to Paul. Uh, happened. Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through the Macedonian Achaia, and after that, then, okay, so he wants, this is his plan. I want to go up back through the churches, and then from there I want to go back to Jerusalem, and he said, then after that, i got to go to Rome. I, I want to go preach in Rome. i, I got to go to the, the headquarters of the, the greatest empire on the face of the earth, okay? i, I got to go preach there. That's his plan. And uh, then it said, he sent two of his helpers, Timothy, <coughs> and Erastus to Macedonian, so he sends them up there, and while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. And about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Man. Sometimes it's like things are going just too good. And boom, all of a sudden there's this huge disturbance about the way and about the Christian way. A silversmith by the name of Demetrius, who had made silver shrines of Artemis. Uh, Diana, uh, goes by a lot of names, this gal. This is her statue, okay? Um, she's a fertility goddess. You can tell by, she's got a lot of breasts. Uh, I know that you were wondering what that is, but that's, she got, some think it's not. Some think it is, has something else to do and it's just some, a costume she's wearing. But most people think that it's because she's a fertility goddess uh, and she's got a lot of breasts. Uh, he made these shrines of her, brought her, and it brought into him no little business for a craftsman. Man, he is selling these shrines. He's this big business. He's making money. All right? See, the problem is, if you're selling shrines and Paul's preaching, there's no, they're nothing, you're losing business. Right? And so what's going to happen here? Men, we receive goods, a good income from this business. And you see how Paul has led astray a large number of people here in Ephesus? He says that man-made gods are no gods at all. He's killing our business. There is danger not only for our trade that will lose our good, it'll lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great god, goddess Artemis uh, will be discredited and the goddess herself will be robbed of her divine majesty. We got to defend her. And when they heard this, they became furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Soon the whole city was in uproar. It's spreading. I mean, everywhere. It's through the streets. They're shouting and screaming, great is this God, the God of uh, Ar Ar Artemis. And the people seized Gaius and Ar Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions at this point, from Macedonia, and they rushed as one man into the theater. Well, here's the theater that was there at Ephesus. Pretty sizable theater, huh? And so, you got to imagine, they're all rushing in, filling the stands, okay? Their stands, and they're all shouting, screaming, great is this goddess, all right? Paul wanted to appear before the crowd. But the disciples will not let him. Can you imagine? He wants to go out and preach the gospel to these guys. <laughs> it's a hostile crowd. Here's Paul Bale. Oh, give it, let, let me go in. Even some of the officials of the providence, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. They all shouted in unison for about two hours. <laughs> Can you imagine you going to the Olympics for two hours? USA, USA, right? <laughs> Two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. I mean, you got a, a, a crowd going crazy here. The clerk quieted down the crowd. Men of Ephesus. <coughs> he comes out on the platform. Men of Ephesus. These men have neither robbed the temple nor blasphemed our goddess. <clears throat> if there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. 
As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting since there is no reason for it. And after he said this, he dismissed the assembly. So what's the, what are we to make of all this chapter? Okay, that we're, we've been going through. Uh, it should make me stronger in my, my walk, in my speaking. See, you become stronger. If, you, if you're not stronger, you've got to check. Do I have, an, am I adequately grounded in the Word? Paul is not ashamed because he knows the Word. <laughs> if I don't feel like I can talk to people about Jesus, I, it's usually because I don't feel like I'm adequate to do it. And so I just need to get grounded more. Is the Word adequately in you? That's what I'm saying. Like the Bereans are searching and finding out and they're coming up with the answers. When somebody asks me a question I don't know, I go hunt for the answer to it. Now I got it for the next time somebody asks me a question I don't know. Do you know the God of the Word? That's the question. Are you unashamed of the Word? Or is it too offensive or inoffensive, politically correct for you? When the uproar had ended, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said goodbye and set out for Macedonia. And so he travels throughout the area speaking many words of encouragement to the people, and finally arrived down in Greece, where he stayed three months. We're not told where he stayed, but he stays in Greece. Uh, Macedonia is the northern half, Greece is the lower half. And because the Jews made a plot against him, just as he was about to sail for Syria, he decided to go back through, he was going to go to, but he heard a plot to get him, so he backtracks, and uh, he was accompanied by Sophater from Berea, all these guys, all right, he's accompanied by them, and these men went ahead and waited for him at Troas, so they went ahead, waited for him, Paul sailed from Philippi uh, five days later, and he meets up with them at Troas. And on the first day of the week while he's there, he came together to break bread. Isn't that interesting? First day of the week, Sunday, they get together, they're celebrating the Lord's Supper. Okay? And uh, Paul spoke to the people because he intended to leave the next day, and he kept on talking till midnight. You think I speak long. <laughs> All right? How about if I said, we're gonna, I'm going to keep on till midnight? <laughs> All right. Well, guess what happened? He's speaking until midnight. There's a guy that was sitting in the upper window. Win window. He sat in the window. A young man by the name of Eutychus. He was sinking into deep sleep as Paul was talking. I've watched some of you do that. <laughs> <laughs> fell into a deep sleep while he was talking. But he's sitting in the window. He fell to the ground from the third story. Boop. Oh, if you notice that, watch. Yeah. Boop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Poor guy falls off the window. He's dead. Paul goes down. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. <coughs> He's alive. <coughs> then they went upstairs, and they broke bread, and they ate. After talking until daylight. Wait, wait. He spoke till midnight? Then he spoke all night? Remember when I told you those early churches were being taught a lot? They were being taught a lot. They, there was a lot of teaching going on in the early church. And uh, that's because we didn't have to compete with TV and sports. And, you know, you just go down the whole list. All right. And they, they, until the daylight, and then he left. Okay, they broke the bread, then he left. Um, and uh, the people uh, took the young man home alive, and they were greatly comforted. We come to his farewell message. We're getting down towards the end of uh, his journey here. We set sail and arrived at Miletus. So he left, gets to Miletus. And there Paul had decided, <clears throat> decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time there in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, Paul sat, uh, <clears throat> sent to the Ephesus, okay, uh, for the elders of the church, and when they arrived, he said to them, you know how I live the whole time I was with you from the first day I came to the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and although I was severely tested by uh, pl the plots of the Jews, oh, I, I got some highlight. you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly from house to house. I have to declare both to the Jews and the Greek that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. House to house. Preaching repentance and faith. They are two sides of the same coin. We call it heads and tails. It's faith and repentance. If you have faith, you've had to repent. 
If you have repentance, you have to have faith. Repentance means I'm turning from something. I'm going in this direction, and I hear the message, and I believe that that message there is true, so I turn around, and I embrace the, the message, and I believe it. And so it's like two sides of the same coin. If a person has genuinely believed, they have repented. And if they genuinely repent, they believe. All right? That's just the way it works. The testimony is the second phase is uh, to the present. He's been talking about his past. Now he says, and now I can, I'm compelled by the Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city where the Holy, where Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. God has already told him, it's not going to be easy to follow me. And Paul says, you know what? I'm still compelled by the Spirit. I am going. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. This reminds me a lot of my like verse, Philippians 3, 7. But whatsoever is to my profit, I now consider lost for the sake of Christ. I consider them to be rub rubbish that I may gain Christ. He said, I don't care about anything of this life. It's all about Jesus. If only I may finish the race. This is part of my life, verse 2. Forgetting what is behind and straining, straining forward ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me. Right here in, in Acts 20, he's saying the same thing in a different way. He said, however, I consider my life worth nothing if only I may finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has for me, the task of testifying of the gospel. I am, in Romans chapter 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And so Paul, Paul is here sharing with the Ephesian elders his his testimony about the present. I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. I'm not coming back here. God has showed that to me. You are not in my future. I am moving on. Therefore, I declare today that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. The, the, the term actually there is the whole counsel of God. What God ha, has declared and, and shown, he said, I am not picking and choosing from the Bible. That's why my preaching ministry often goes through books of the Bible. Because you can't pick and choose. You get everything that is there in that book. All right? You, 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 you can't avoid anything. Here's the warning for the future. Remember, he said he's talking to the, the elders from Miletus that were down at, from, uh, they're at Miletus, but they were sent from Ephesus. They come down to Miletus, to, and Paul's talking to them. He says, keep watch over yourself. Anybody remember that? How many were here last Wednesday night? Ash Wednesday, yeah. Pay close attention to yourself. Well, that's what he says. Keep watch over yourself and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you seer. Okay, he's speaking to the elders. So I made Paul old here. Did you see that? <laughs> he got a great beard, okay? So he's speaking to the elders, and, and he's talking to them as overseers. They take the oversight. The word is bishop. The bishop is an overseer. He takes the oversight. So elders, bishops, and watch what he tells them to do. Be shepherds. That's the word pastor. So I got with a, a shepherd staff. He's spiritually old or mature, he knows the word. He takes the oversight over God's flock. He shepherds them and he leads them by the still waters of the word of God. And so that's what he's doing here. He's saying, I believe this is one and the same. The elders were pastors and bishops. The bishops were elders and pastors. And there, there, there are three terms for the same individual. He says, be shepherds of the church of God. Okay, but watch yourself. You gotta watch yourself. You all know of ministers who've fallen. They only fall because they don't watch themselves. If they would pay it close attention to themselves in the Word, the likelihood of falling is very slim. But if you don't pay attention to yourself and to the Word, you will. And he said, pay attention to yourself. He says, and all the flock. He said, as overseers, he goes on and he says, be good shepherds <clears throat> of the church of God which he bought. He refers back to God. This is really important. This preposition, he, refers back to God. God bought with his own blood. 
Folks, I'll tell you something. This is so this this is profound theology here. Jesus is the God man. We saw that in our last three Septembers and no, three three Sundays in September, okay? And uh, we, we studied that he is God. God experienced the death on the cross. The humanity of Jesus and the divinity of Jesus are so united you can't separate the one from the other. They're not to be confused. But are enjoying in such a way that God experiences buying with his, God's own blood. So God somehow in the incarnation experiences everything we do in our humanity. Isn't that something? He experienced God has experienced because God fought with his blood. It's not saying a man's blood. This is God's blood. So Jesus the God man. This is a powerful verse. I think this is an awesome verse. Just kind of tucked away in the Bible. Most people miss it. They read right through there. But that <laughs> Jesus is God. And then his blood was God's blood. Very cool. <clears throat> so then it goes, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in. He's talking about people. We will come in among you and we will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and they will distort the truth. Folks, that's why we are built on the word of God, the Bible. And if our constitution contradicts the Bible, guess, what, guess which one wins? <laughs> Bible wins. Constitution's got to be changed. The preacher says something that's not quite right, and then there's the Bible. Who's right? Bible. The Bible. Yeah, the, the preacher's wrong. That's just the way it is, okay? And or he says, they're gonna, some are going to come along to draw away the disciples after themselves. So be on your guard and remember that for three years, I never stopped warning you. That's part of the pastor's job is to warn you. Day and night with tears. And now I commit, <clears throat> I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted your money. You know that. I had my own, I, I had my own career. He said, everything I did, I showed you that the kind of hard work, uh, that by this kind of hard work that we must help the weak, remembering the words of Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When all this, he said all this, he knelt down, they wept, embraced him, he, they kissed him, he was... What, <clears throat> what grieved them the most was the statement that he, they would never see his face again. And then they accompanied him to a ship. And from the ship, he sails back to, I think that's, was that Tyre? After he passed through South Lake, sailed to Syria. Oh, yeah, he landed at Tyre. And then from Tyre, uh, he's forbidden. He said, Paul, not, <clears throat> he was finding the disciples there. We stayed with them seven days, though this, and the, through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. His friends don't get it, that he's, he's got a mission to accomplish. <clears throat> and they said, the Lord's will be done, when he said, when he told them he, he was, would not be dissuaded, he is go going to go, uh, the Lord's will be done, he said. Paul was done. So we arrive, he arrives at Jerusalem, and we're finishing the uh, third missionary journey. We're going to stop at the there. We're not going to get to the, his last journey. It's a fun journey, though. But you got the notes. You can read it. <clears throat> what I want to, want to say here, though, this was a... We followed the path. And he's made his way all the way back. Winds up in Jerusalem. At Jerusalem, he's going to have three trials between Festus, no, Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. You know, the trial of Agrippa is very interesting because uh, he says to, to Paul as he's preaching the gospel to Agrippa, King Agrippa, he says to him, almost you have persuaded me to become a Christian. Paul said, I wish it were more than almost. I wish it was every, all, all in. Except for the chains. Because <laughs> he's there as a prisoner. Okay? And, and everywhere he goes, even in prison, Paul is sharing his faith everywhere he goes. Let me sum this up. We're all on the journey of life, and God has something for every one of us to accomplish. What is it that he wants you to accomplish with the rest of your life? You know, we're living longer. Uh, a few years back, uh, I read an article that said if you were living at the time, you have a 50-50 chance of reaching 100. And that would include most of us here because we were alive when we were, I read that article. You've got a 50-50 chance of living to be at 100. Now, you do the math, subtract how old you are between now and then. 
God is letting you live longer for a reason. What is my mission for the rest of my life? That's the question. For the rest of my life. I ask, what is your Jerusalem? You know, what is your Jerusalem? That's where I'm at right now. Remember? We're to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the earth. Where's my Jerusalem? You know, for our missionaries that we sent to Budapest, Budapest is now their Jerusalem. <laughs> I used to be in Muskegon. That was my Jerusalem. Now I'm in Waterford. Waterford's my Jerusalem. What is my mission where I'm at right now? That's, that's the question. The fourth missionary journey. We're going to stop here, okay? This was fun. But, and unless you want to go on. Good job. Let's, let's, let's break. Maybe, maybe we'll get to the fourth one another time. All right. Next week is a church business meeting, right? Congregational meeting after the service. All right. So we won't do this. The following week, we're going to have in the evening a concert of prayer. All right. I'd really like to invite you to come back at 6 o'clock for the concert of prayer. It's not like any kind of prayer meeting you've been to before. It's, it's going to be great. And uh, the last thing is to be uh, make this your Jerusalem. We passed out these outreach sheets before. I need these back as soon as possible. What you do is you take a sheet, you drive down a, a street, <coughs> you pick the street you want to pray for, you write down the address, and there's a short little prayer at the top that you pray. And it goes like this. Oh, Lord, my heart's desire and prayer for this home is that they might become and they might come to the faith in Jesus and to our church. It's your prayer. You just stop in front of everyone you pray for. Them. You write them down. You write the street, the city. The name is only if you see a name. You know, like somebody might have the Johnsons or they might have a name on it. Well, then give us that because in that way when we send it, we can address it to a name. I have only found like one name on my last 30 or so that I did, okay? So you, you won't find many, but if you do find something, like put it down. <clears throat> you bring this back to us. We'll make a photocopy so we can begin our processing it and give you your copy back. You can continue to pray over them. Just pray over the sheets. Say, Lord, I pray for every one of these. I'm praying that, that these people might come to faith in Christ and come to our church. It's very simple. We will then, once you turn this back to us, we will give you a stack of cards that you can fill out to these people. If you want to. If you don't want to fill those cards out, just let us know. We will send a postcard to them with the church address. On. We just want inviting them to come to our Easter service. Okay? This is an outreach so that we get them to come to our Easter service. Our Easter service, we got a little postcard we made like this. <clears throat> it says, he took our place, but why? On the back it says, he took our place, but why? This, <clears throat> this Easter, discover why God allowed Jesus to die and rise again. There, there is a reason, and it has to do with you. God cares about you so much, and we will share the proof that he does. Join us. And it's got the date. It says it's a casual atmosphere. You can remain anonymous. Come in, slip in, slip out. So uh, that kind of thing. This is just a postcard to invite people to come. You know, we did this at Christmas, and I think there were like five different people who were here in that blizzard blizzardous conditions because of those cards. Now, it could snow on April 1st. I hope not. <laughs> but uh, if we reach five more people, by invitation, all of us collectively, the ones we sent to before, we're going to send a postcard to this time again. We're wanting to get, add to that group a group of new people that we're going to invite for Easter. When we're done with that group, we will then add them to the, the database, the mailing, and next Christmas, we'll be sending out to them again as we try to add some more that we prayed over that God would draw them to our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you don't have a sheet, pick one up. If you have a sheet, we need to start getting them in because Easter is just around the corner. I mean, even if each of us only prays for 10 or even 20 people, yes. you know, there's another three or 400 people we could reach. Absolutely. And, and we've sent out, I think, about 450 the last time. It'd be great if everybody did like 10, 15, but what? you don't have to go crazy on it. And then we get those back in, we'll, next, we'll be up to 1,000 invitations. You know, we do it again in the fall. Oh my goodness, this thing just keeps growing where we're inviting people to the, the main events where they're, they're likely to go to a church service, okay? Let me close with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so blessed. Out of all the world, you've called us, you've chosen us, you've saved us that we might be messengers of the good news. 
and that we might share it with those in our community as we try to, through our missionaries, do it globally and even in our region. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless us, that we will have such a, a testimony that people will be asking us why we are the way we are. And we can tell them about how Jesus saved us from an old lifestyle and changed our lives and that they can have it too. Lord, I just pray that your blessing will be upon us even in this outreach of prayer evangelism where we pray for these homes that people will come to know Jesus. Bless it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.